for the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for more updates. Did you know that Uttar Pradesh ranked third in the income tax filings last year? Did you know that the income slab of rupees 20 to 50 lakh witnessed a four-fold increase in tax filings? Hello and welcome to another edition of Capital Calculus. I'm your host, Anil Padmanabhan. A few weeks ago, the union government released data on the income tax filings of the salaried. As previously reported on this show, the ITRs of the income tax returns of the salaried jumped to a record high of 7.4 crore. Compared to a decade earlier, this is almost a doubling. Look beneath the hood as it were and we discover that the ITRs for every salaried slab witnessed a dramatic jump. It either doubled, trebled or in some instances grew fourfold. This begs the question that are Indians growing rich? To understand this and more, we spoke to Firoz Aziz, the deputy CEO of Anandrati. I began by asking Firoz on his thoughts about the ITR filings, especially about the wealth effect that seems to be kicking in. See, I think uh, it's very clear that the granularity of the wealth effect in India uh, is becoming more and more prominent. One. Two, I think uh, the compliance has shot up dramatically as well. Uh, and the, the, the kind of education which has happened on the necessity of being compliant. Uh, it is not that anybody was intentionally non-compliant. There's so many, today, so many tax filings happen where there's no income tax to be paid, but uh, the urge to be compliant is also very clearly apparent. Uh, for, uh, to my mind, since the kind of education in terms of the financialization and the digitization has happened, uh, there is there is clearly uh, the the wealth is spreading from the metros to beyond, and I think we are a very large country uh, where uh, there are several pin codes from every nook and corner today. Uh, you see a sharp rise uh, in that data of income tax uh, clearly. Firoz, you mentioned the wealth effect that is playing out. If I just share some numbers with you from the ITR filings, not from uh, this latest around, but I've compared with uh, what uh, last year's with uh, data 10 years ago. So, you know, the say for example, the 5 to 10 lakh category, the filers have gone up from 3.70 million to 11.09 million. It's almost trebled. So, if you tag with the regional trends, what is the kind of perspective that you have staying on the theme you just touched? You see, uh, I think uh, what is happening is uh, uh, the kind of income uh, distribution which was reasonably lopsided uh, because if there is formalization in the economy, uh, businesses are reporting more taxes, uh, more profits and paying more taxes and professionals, which is largely the salaried class, we, if I'm not wrong, there are about 27 crore EPFO accounts active. Uh, if there was tax compliance at a business level, be it small business somewhere in a tier three city, if that becomes more tax compliant, it is not just more tax being collected, it's more money to be given to the professional. If the taxes were not being paid properly or the profits were not rightly shown, uh, then professional gets it from the profit kitty of the business. So what is happening is it was a government being shortchanged and also as a collateral damage, professional getting shortchanged. Okay, so uh, it is very, very saddening to see uh, that uh, there are just about a lakh and a half people in a country of our size who earn more than one crore from 16th of a crore, right? That's like ridiculously small four decimal number out of the 27 crore EPF accounts. So it very clearly says professionals in India have not made money because several loopholes have been exploited. I think that's changing. So the wealth effect is very prominent over the last 10 years. 
I'm just trying to go to the cause and the effect relationship. Uh, it is economy doing well, of course, uh, which is apparent to naked eye. But the second, the tax compliance is also benefiting the professional fraternity. And that's why you see that kind of tripling and quadrupling in several basic categories of 5 to 10 lakhs of income tax returns being filed. So, Feroz, uh, this process that you just explained to us will presumably get a big, uh, Philip, thanks to the digital economy that we are seeing in operation, the particularly the unique uh, digital public good infrastructure that India is employing, right? Yes, I think, uh, of course, the digitization brings a lot of formality. I think, see, uh, one is from an individual standpoint, digitization is a larger tool of convenience, but there is a huge collateral benefit. See, I was looking at the data of the household savings in India 10 years back, was only not, I can't call such a large number only, but 2 lakhs, 270 lakh crore was the household savings of the entire country. 10 years from then, uh, the total household savings has grown from 270 lakh crores to 670 lakh crores. Indians have this huge urge to save because we have come with an environment of survival of the fittest. I can never complain of an Indian saving less. Okay, I was in the US a few months back. There was a guy who runs an NBFC. Uh, he told me that people borrow for a holiday with an EMI of seven years. I said for a holiday, people borrow for seven years. Here we save very well. So coming back to your point of digitization, I think because of the digitization and the financialization, the return of India, Indian households on their investments can go up. Because last 10 years, the average Indian's return of the household is only 6.7% compounded return is what people have made. They have only... 4% of their money in equity mutual funds. They have more money in currency, which is hard currency, like savings account, current account, than in equity mutual funds. So digitization will have a benefit to convenience to people. Digitization will bring in more tax compliance from a government standpoint. And the collateral benefit of digitization will be financialization, which can result in an improvement in the return of the 670 lakh crore of household savings, which Indians have put on the table. Firas, this uh, financialization of savings must be most manifesting in your industry, which is the mutual fund industry, which is a generally uh, platform that democratizes savings. Yes, Anand, sir, it certainly does. Uh, of course, the base is small, uh, is why it looks very heartening. We have 40 lakh crores as approximately uh, the mutual fund AUM currently out of which equity is little over half or almost half of it, uh, which is grown significantly from some 20, 22 lakh crores about four, five years back to 40 lakh crores today, which is a healthy 13, 14% rate of growth. But if you forget the industry, forget the base, and then look at it from a India perspective, it is uh, very disheartening for us as the industry participants that we can do more for India is because the physical assets movement from for the last 10 years, 10 years back, we had done a study, it was 51% physical assets and 49% financial assets, including currency, deposits, small savings, all of it put together, which comes in the financial services, uh, financial assets, and the physical assets are largely real estate and gold. The percentage after 10 big years has changed by only 1%. In spite of real estate not doing very well, okay, the market values of real estate have not moved in the last 10 years, especially residential real estate, till 52%. Uh, 50, 52 has come down to 51. Now, having seen that number as an industry participant, I personally think 10 years from now, when I like to be proud of the industry, if this number has a change, which can change the return of Indian household savings, because it is impossible to make inflation beating returns with this asset allocation of India, right? So unless the asset allocation changes significantly, India is always going to be, uh, as a group, as an average Indian, we will be underperforming uh, the inflation, which is not a great news. And I think uh, that's where uh, the conducive environment provided by the government in terms of digitization 
should be able to propel us to achieve this objective for Indian households. So how do you flip this trend in uh, the proportion, I mean? See, if you have to flip this trend, everybody, every stakeholder has to have a macro view from government, what is India's return? A media, uh, a, a, a media house, mainstream media house needs to say personal finance deserves that importance, right? Today, when, when you see mainstream media, uh, there's eight hours of trading information. Uh, and somewhere after the market closes, there is a 15-minute slot on a, in, a, in the night uh, where the viewership is so low to discuss personal finance. Every trader needs personal finance, right? A trader takes a home loan. A trader files his taxes. I think this whole importance to personal finance by persons is very low. Uh, so if that doesn't change, uh, the asset allocation of India can't change. So every stakeholder, be it an asset management company, a distributor like us, a mainstream media like uh, uh, all the big business channels, all of them need to uh, take personal finance personally. So this uh, trend, is it also getting a nudge, this wealth effect, that is, because of uh, you know, rising professionalism where you're getting ESOPs, you are, uh, you know, the uh, new wealth that is being created in the stock markets. Is that kind of nudging the wealth effect and in turn adding to greater formalization and financialization of savings? I think uh, uh, like ESOP are a very top of the pyramid uh, instrument, uh, right? It's so, so much on the tip of the pyramid. Uh, that, uh, of course, that is wealth in terms of quantums could be very, very large because today you have 110 unicorns. Ten years back, there were 10 unicorns. So startup culture has been propelled, has been promoted, has uh, uh, today being uh, an entrepreneur is not a taboo. If somebody were to, a youngster would have told his parents that I want to start up something, he's not going to get a, why don't you get just a, uh, a bank job? Uh, that would have been the kind of conversations which would be happening in families 10 years back, 15 years back today. That's a more acceptable norm that a youngster, 25 year, can actually have his idea uh, 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 implemented in the form of a startup. So that has happened. So of course, the wealth effect has uh, taken, uh, got a tailwind because of ESOPs and the unicorns and the startup culture. Uh, but also, I think we as Indians are largely entrepreneurial in nature. Okay, if their energies are channelized well, uh, the jugaad, as we call it in India, can become, instead of jugaad, uh, become something entrepreneurial. Uh, but the dimaag hai, the risk-taking capability hai, Indian ki kafi zada hai. So I think uh, the wealth effect will take different exponential uh, curves uh, once this energy of this young country uh, can be channelized in the right direction. So there's another structural trend that we are witnessing simultaneously is the growth of the middle class. Today it is about 400 million. It is projected to grow to about 700 odd million by 2030 and a staggering 1 billion by 2047. So from all that we have discussed, how do you see this transforming the way Indians save, invest uh, and the whole business of personal finance? Yes, sir. So if you look at how the India is stratified, because we are in the business of uh, wealth uh, uh, distribution and uh, product distribution. So it's, of course, we would have tried to stratify the segment. Uh, HNI in India is only 8 lakh families, as per several reports. Uh, HNI defined as a person who has more than a million dollars other than the home or he or she lives in. That's just 8, 10 lakh families, give or take. Uh, so it leaves a lot of families uh, in the lower part. So when, when the country largely is moving from bottom heavy, uh, it will naturally move to mid heavy. Uh, and uh, I hope it will turn into not a pyramid, uh, but I think the middle class growth is inevitable because if you're trying to uplift the country in terms of the granularity of the wealth distribution, uh, they will first become middle class because the largest portion is today living uh, in, uh, in very, very bad means. And that has become better but there's a mile to cover. And so point one, yes, the middle class is going to be very, very large. Second, the mass affluent is going to be very large uh, to 
uh, and I think the great part is they're being educated to manage their monies, manage uh, their taxes, manage their expenses better. Uh, I think that whole education, they're, they're, they're being taught to cover their risks better. Now, today you have uh, you have insurances, health insurances uh, given uh, up to 5 lakh rupees. So that is one thing which I think covering the risk, if you don't have a current social security mechanism, covering the risk is very important. And if you're teaching them to do that when you're poor, when they actually uh, become middle class, they are used to a cover. So if they're not covered in the scheme also, they will have this practice of buying that. So, so middle class is going to be a growing segment. Uh, because I think uh, once the lower pyramid moves up, it has to first reach the middle class and then go to the other uh, part of the pyramid. So, uh, Firas, how is this playing or the mass affluent intersecting with the mutual fund industry? In your own experience as industry and your own well, company, are you seeing the pin codes beyond the metros and you know, not just the super metros, but all the metros are you seeing a more democratization through the mutual fund industry, which can broaden this wealth effect? Unprecedented. Uh, what we are seeing is unprecedented in terms of the granularity of applications which come from mutual power to the mutual fund industry, depending on the distribution network of asset management companies. The largest asset management company, which is SBI AMC, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, gets uh, applications in their new funds uh, from 98% or 97% of India's PIN codes. And that's a lot of uh, PIN codes, right? Uh, so that's the great part. Second, I think it is not just the extent of spread of this money, but it is also the prudence of this money. Uh, I was very, very excited to know uh, that in spite of a one and a half, two year correction in the markets, the SIP numbers kept going up. Otherwise, in the past, 2013 was a landmark decision of educating people because Sebi uh, came up with a paper which says that a lot of money needs to be spent on investor education. And that's uh, that's this for this year, the amount is almost like 800 crores set aside uh, for investor education. And that 10 years of effort of investor education has resulted in people, the retail guy, not coming last. The conversation with Feroz only confirms our initial hunch that Indians are becoming rich. However, this is a relative claim, given that for most of the seven decades, the poor have been the single biggest cohort in the Indian population. However, there are enough trends to suggest that a pivot has begun. Like I always say, India's best is yet to come. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Strat News Global on YouTube. Hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates. And if you like this show, please hit the like button. And if you have any ideas and suggestions, please do reach out to us. I'm available on Twitter at Capital Calculus. I'll be back next week with another episode. Till then, stay safe.